You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the first Doctor story, The Daleks Master Plan. Although we are only discussing the first four episodes this time, and we'll discuss the others in uh, two subsequent episodes. We're splitting it into three. So, uh, but this time we're talking about episodes one to four of the Daleks Ma- Master Plan. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hey, Father Corey. How's it going? And Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, remember to like the Secrets of Doctor Who on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Secrets of Doctor Who. Retweet us. We're at SQPN. And uh, leave us comments where you find us on social media. We love to hear from you. Uh, another show on the StarQuest Network I'm sure you'll enjoy that you should check out is called The Secrets of Technology, which you can find wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash technology. And we will have more of your great listener feedback at the end of the episode, so stick around for that. All right, so Dalek's Master Plan. Uh, before we get into the recap, just to kind of uh, note, you know, again, uh, we're doing the first four episodes now. Next time we'll be doing episodes five, six, and eight because we've already discussed episode seven, the uh, Christmas, the very first Christmas special from Doctor Who, The Feast of Stephen. We did that uh, a while back. And uh, then we will do the final nine to 12 uh, episodes. So just so you know. Uh, so, Jimmy, can you give us a recap of what happens in these first four episodes? This week, the Doctor and new companion Katarina, fresh from the Myth Makers, are very concerned about Stephen, who was poisoned in that adventure. In search of a cure, they land in the year 4000 on the planet Kimbrel, the same planet we saw a few stories ago in Mission to the Unknown, where none of our regular cast appeared and everybody died. On Kimbrel, the Doctor and companions meet the Brigadier, who is pretending to be a space security agent named Brett Vian, the sole survivor of a follow-up mission to find the people from Mission to the Unknown. At first, they don't trust Brett, but he proves his worth by giving Katarina pills that cure Stephen's poisoning. Unfortunately, Kimbrel not only has deadly plants, but deadly Daleks, and they have a master plan to conquer the Earth and the solar system. To this end, they're holding a secret conference of aliens, most of whom are from the outer galaxies, but one member of the conspiracy is the traitorous human guardian of the solar system, Mavic Chen. A key part of the Daleks' master plan is a terrible weapon called the Time Destructor, but it needs a core made of the rare mineral terranium. Mavic Chin turns over one such core to the Dalek Council, but the Doctor has infiltrated the Council and steals it. Our heroes, including Brett Vian, then take a stolen spaceship to go warn Earth about the Daleks and Mavic Chin, but on the way they're forced to land on a prison planet. When they take off, one prisoner grabs Katarina and uses her as a hostage. He drags her into the airlock, but Katarina pushes the button to open the door to space, resulting in the very first companion death in the history of Doctor Who. Eventually, the rest make it back to Earth, but they don't know who they can trust. Mavic Chen has also made it back, and he tells space security agent Sarah Kingdom to go get the Terranium Corps back and kill Brett Vian and those who are with him because they're traitors. The audience doesn't know this yet, but Sarah Kingdom is actually Brett Vian's sister, and she's loyal to the order she's been given. When she confronts our heroes and demands the Terranium, Brett won't give it to her. He goes for his gun, but Sarah is quicker and shoots her own brother dead. The end. <laughs> spoilers, so, spoilers. Oh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Father Corey, uh, overall impression of this one? You know, for what is effectively, well, the first third, but introduction of this entire serial, because this really kind of, it's setting the platform of what the whole plan is. It's setting the locations. It's setting, you know, everything that's going on it really moves pretty quick i mean these these mm-hmm. four episodes move fairly quickly there's there's not a lot of of fluff in them and so that that's that, that and it's it made it quite enjoyable mm-hmm. now these are we'll talk a little bit about it but these are lost episodes there's only three of the episodes are actually available in their full context and only one of them is from these four um, mm-hmm. so, uh, we, we, you know, that, that makes it a little bit more difficult because you're not able to watch the original, uh, content as it was aired, but it's still, you know, listening to it and, you know, they, they do move fairly quickly. Jimmy, how about you? 
Yeah, I think they move quite quickly. I mean, this is really, when you count Mission to the Unknown, this is a 13-part story. Mm -hmm. And normally, I mean, if something gets up to six parts, I'm like, okay, this is not going to be super fun. But this does really, this first part of it especially, it really moves. Um, I watched uh, re I watched Reconstructions, for the most part, on Daily Motion. Um, you know, they, there is the one episode, episode two, I believe, that yep. survives. Um, and I watched that on Daily Motion. And the others had, were kind of based on a telesnap-like procedure, but they also incorporated a little bit of fan animation into them and and they were nicely done but i like this this is a good story and it's gonna go weird places in the future <laughs> so uh in, in, I, in addition i should say yeah. in addition to having the first uh companion death this is also the first appearance of nicholas courtney in the series as yeah. i mentioned he's not yet playing the brigadier he's playing this space security agent brett vian and we're going to have the first returning antagonist because the meddling monk is going to be back, and that's the first time that an individual antagonist, as opposed to just the Daleks, are back. It's the first time an individual antagonist has come back. Uh, the director, Douglas Camfield, uh, apparently liked Nicholas Courtney so much in this that when he came back to direct The Web of Fear, mm -hmm. he cast him as um, not yet Brigadier. Colonel. Um, Colonel. Lethbridge Stewart, yes. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, it was uh yeah good choice I, I Nicholas Courtney in this was great I was mm -hmm. actually disappointed to see him die at the end of these uh, I was I, I have not seen these before so uh, the, he, he yeah, won't be the only one yeah. yep. um but uh, I listened to it on uh, Audible with linking mm -hmm. narration by um Stephen, Peter Purvis uh, yep Peter, Peter Purvis, Purvis. Yep. yes uh, Purvis and um and but also watched and sometimes actually synced up the uh, the, the audio from the audible with the video of episode two, just cause I wanted to hear the, you know, continue hearing that cause actually the sound was better too. Uh, mm -hmm. and then, but watch, cause I like to see if I can, you know, the direction and the acting on the screen, um, and the costumes and the, you know, the crazy aliens and that sort of stuff. So <laughs> uh, that was a, a fun way to do it. A lot of the, um, fan animation I could find, was kind of well, really bad. <laughs> there's one there's one fan animation that's really bad. Yeah. And I didn't watch yeah. that one. What I watched was it was tele, essentially telesnaps only in this case it wasn't the same guy doing the telesnaps, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it was essentially telesnaps but then they would use animation for certain bits of it where they would like add motion a little bit of motion to the screen like if right. the if you're on the Dalek spaceship the Daleks will have a screen in the background and they'll be playing a an abstract animation of the Doctor Who opening theme vortex mm -hmm. on that screen sure. just to add a little bit of motion to the screen or they'll have something light up you know they'll have a blinking light on a panel right. and it just adds a little motion and then when you have no characters but Daleks they'll just animate the Daleks and that looks mm -hmm. fine I saw that one. Yeah. yeah. I saw one of those like that. Yeah. 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 See, They'll also stitch in clips that have survived, even though they're not whole episodes. Right. Mm -hmm. See, I, I did the, um, I did the, the audible, but I w just watched the second one because mm -hmm. I, since that was a complete episode, it, you know, like, like you said, Dom, the, the audio quality wasn't as good, but it was still being able to experience it the way it yeah. was meant to be experienced, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was, that was kind of nice. At least you do get that little break. And I believe as it episode five and episode 10, Jimmy are the other mm -hmm. ones that are still in Sounds existence. Right. Yeah. Mm. So, so each, each, uh, of the three parts of our, are watching this, will at least have one episode. You'll be able to actually watch. So, right. There's also, uh, Oh, also speaking of, uh, clips that have survived the clip of Katarina's death has survived and that stitched in to the version I saw. I didn't see that. Yeah. yeah. The, the thing is they like loaned it, they had episode four and they loaned it to blue Peter for a 10th anniversary of doctor who or something. And, and of all the things they wanted to show the first companion death on a children's program. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but that's how that clip ended up surviving. Also, you mentioned the crazy aliens. I really love the crazy aliens in this, <laughs> that are on the that are on the council. They look great. They're yeah. all different. I mean, they're all primitive, but they're in, in makeup technology. But they all look great. I love those aliens. Yeah, yeah, and they reproduce them in the mission to the unknown, so you yep. can see them yep. there in that high quality. Uh, 
So a couple other things to just mention was uh, this is the longest serial. Uh, it's not undisputed. There is some you know debate over it, but this is uh, to, to many the longest single story mm-hmm. in Doctor Who. Um, some people say that the Trial of Time Lord, which is yeah, fourteen that's, episodes, that, but that's 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 really four separate stories. Yep. Yeah, with a linking narration, really, yeah. like a, a linking framework. Uh, yeah, I agree key to that. time would fit that as well. Right, mm-hmm. right, exactly. It's an arc, really. That's that's what that was. But this is a single story, so this would be the longest. Um, so yeah, um, so you know, some of it was I had to. Re- it's interesting that they put myth makers in between uh in mission of the unknown first we kind of talked about that when we talked about mission of the unknown uh so you have to remember oh who's mark Corey? and yep. you know they they come up they don't you know they, they didn't do back then what we do now which was previously on doctor who <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh but, but you know you, so you have to kind of remember so we have this mission being had been sent with brett and um this other guy who dies qu- really quickly uh to go look for Kem, go to Kembrel and look for Mark Corey, you know, um, and, and and so we have uh, you know that that set up that character of Brett right there right at the beginning, and then we have the Katarina on board the the TARDIS with uh, sick Stephen who we who he wasn't this sick when we left him at the in the Mythmakers, but he like you know, collapsed they, at the very end. Yeah, yeah, and he's got apparently blood poisoning or something, which mm-hmm. you know, given that's actually pretty true to primitive warfare like when you get mm-hmm. stabbed and cut mm-hmm. with these very you know dirty weapons you would get infections lots of bacteria and yucks on there so it's gonna <laughs> yeah. happen yeah it was it was not as clean as it uh, tv makes it uh, these days and um but it's interesting to see katarina she's so technologically far behind oh man that everything mm-hmm. has to be explained to her and yeah. i can imagine this might be why they didn't keep her on for very long <laughs> Yeah, so about that, originally, this was going to be Vicky's last story, and it was mm. going to be Vicky who went out the airlock. Oh, wow. Um, but they decided to have Vicky leave in the previous story and give her a happy ending, so she gets to go off and become Cressida with her lover, Troil- Troilus. Um, and so they needed a temporary companion. But they knew, so like when Terry Nation was writing this, he wrote it for, at least in the first draft, it's Vicky going out the airlock mm-hmm. because she had had some disputes behind the scenes with the producers and they wanted to get rid of her. Hmm. Um, but they gave her a happy ending, um, like she complained about dialogue and stuff like that. Um, but um, they wanted a temporary companion, so they wrote Katarina into episode four of the uh, Myth Makers. And she knew the whole time she's just temporary because um, they didn't want a really technologically primitive companion. Now, this, like in this episode, the doctor, she doesn't know what a key is mm-hmm, when mm-hmm. the doctor talks about the key to the TARDIS. And that's ridiculous. They had keys in ancient Greece. Um, she also doesn't know what a when uh, Brett Vian tells her, get some tablets out of my pouch and give them to Stephen, they'll cure his poisoning. Um, she doesn't know what a tablet is. And, and that's, that's ridiculous too. They had, they had, you know, little medicaments that you could eat in ancient Greece. So, you know, I, I think this was a more of a writing, a writer's issue. They didn't know what to do with a character like this. Mm. Then it would, I think a competent person who knew about what an ancient Greek would know. I mean, these are the people who invented philosophy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, now that the golden age of Greek philosophy was sometime later than the Trojan war, but still I wouldn't have a problem writing a character from back then. They could be another Jamie and just roll with anything technological. Um, but she knew that she was only temporary. And in fact, apparently her death scene was one of the first scenes she filmed. Hmm. And, um, and they're, and they're deliberately setting it up like at the end of episode three here, you know, Katarina, now she thinks she's dead and traveling through the underworld with the doctor in his magic temple and they're going to the place of perfection. So like Mm -hmm. the Elysian fields or something. Um, but she, um, uh, she, by the end of episode three, she's telling the doctor, I've got the exact quote. She says, uh, you, so, you show me so many strange mysteries with you. I know I'm safe. 
<laughs> and the doctor <laughs> says, I hope so, my dear. I hope so, which is foreshadowing. Yeah. Because that's the end of episode three. At the beginning of episode four, she goes out the space lock. <laughs> <laughs> She's um yeah she also uh, quite a good screamer I, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. when, when they when she finds the uh, the stowaway prisoner on board let's talk about that scene then because it was interesting to me you know he takes her hostage and drags her into the airlock of all places this, this yeah. prisoner like the, <laughs> bad idea um mm. and she opens the airlock that sucks them both out and that's removing this this person who was preventing who's going to make them take the the TARDIS mm-hmm. to back to Kimbrel yeah. Um, and and it, there was a moment where Steven's like, no, no, not that button, the other one. Mm-hmm. Um, did she sacrifice? Like, and but then later on, they 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 assume she sacrificed herself. Yeah, right. did she sacrifice herself on purpose, or did did she hit the wrong button accidentally? What do you I, think? I, I, I think it's. I think ambiguous. it's in, I think it's ambiguous because she's she's I mean she doesn't even know what a key is she doesn't know how an airlock works right. now they get her in once she's drug into the airlock the doctor is then talking over a, a you know an intercom to the prisoner that's got her hostage and um and he explains enough about how an airlock works that she should have an idea but she doesn't she's not going to know which button is which right yeah. they they never communicate that information she just knows one of these buttons opens a door and she so you can read it either way right. um and and i i I captured the uh from the transcript the exact exchange we have after she pushes the the exterior door button and they get spaced Mm -hmm. steven is horrified and says she pressed the wrong button doctor and the doctor says she may have wanted to dear boy so even the doctor at this moment is Mm -hmm. ambiguous on Mm. did she deliberately press the the exterior button or not she may have wanted to press the exterior button and then he says she wanted to save our lives um, so that's his justification for she may have deliberately done it. Brett well, says she knew she knew that how to open up the TARDIS door, so it would be it wouldn't be a leap at all to say, okay, well, if I do this switch in the TARDIS, it opens the door. If I do a similar looking switch in this ship, it's gonna open the door. Now, whether or not she realized that it opened up the door leading out, of, well, of course, even realizing there was anything in outer in outer space. Yeah. She, right. you know, she clearly knew that, that one of these would open a door. Right. Mm-hmm. And she had been told if she, if the exterior door opens, it'll, it'll kill us. Right. Um, well, they even, they and, even showed where the, they took off and the doctors, oh, I forgot to close the outer door. Oh, and, and Brett was right. able to just do it remotely. Yeah. So. Now to continue. Um, so she, she knows that one of the, if she opens, if she presses the wrong button, they'll die. You know, she knows that. She knows pressing a button will open the door, but she doesn't know which button to press. That hasn't been communicated to her. So the doctor has rational has said she she may have wanted to press the exterior button, and his justification for that is she wanted to save our lives. Brett then says it must have been quick. The doctor says, I hope she reach, she's reached her place of perfection. Stephen says, yes, but not that way. The doctor says she didn't understand. She couldn't understand. She So here we have more ambigu- ambiguity. She didn't understand. She couldn't understand. She wanted to save our lives and perhaps the lives of all the other living beings in the solar system. I hope she's found her perfection. Oh, how I shall always remember her as one of the daughters of the gods. Yes, as one of the daughters of the gods. So this is pure coping on the doctor's mm-hmm. part. It is not clear whether she deliberately or accidentally killed them. Mm-hmm. And the doctor's just speculating. Maybe she wanted to, she want, maybe she was, did it to save us and all the people of the solar system. This is pure copium on the doctor's <laughs> part. This is really, I was surprised in rewatching this. This is cold yeah. on the mm-hmm. writer's part of you because they could have eliminated this ambiguity. They could have had her know full well which button she was pressing and did it deliberately, and they didn't. Yeah. they Yeah, they left it ambiguous. Well, and, and on top of it, there's another ambiguity, which is she thought they were already dead, in, in a sense, mm-hmm. that they were on their traveling to, to the underworld. And the, the, I know that the Greek conception of what af- the afterlife is like is a little ambiguous in, in itself because, well, you know, you could still die in the afterlife. Well, I was going to say, because, I mean, you, you read, you know, the 
Iliad and the Odyssey, and, and he travels through the underworld, but he's not dead. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so the I, <clears throat> for her to do that, to be able to travel through the underworld with the doctor, to be like, oh, yeah, well, I've, I've heard stories that you can do this. Right, right. Yeah. Incidentally, there, there, are, um, there are a couple of follow-ups to this story in the expanded media. One of them is a prose piece called Katerina in the Afterlife, and she makes it to the Elysian Fields. Um, and it's like the, 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 one of the only pieces of Doctor Who authorized expanded literature that deals with the afterlife. Um, so that's kind of neat. There's yeah. also an audio story. Now she, the character appears, um, a few times in Big Finish, but there's one audio story that's particularly notable called Daughter of the Gods, where, um, there, the TARDIS experiences a time crash with itself in between the myth makers and, um, and mission, uh, uh, Dalek's master plan. And Katarina ends up in an, in a different future where she doesn't die. And with the second doctor and I, you know, I don't know who Jamie and whoever, um, and the Dalek master plan succeeds. Mm. And so in a Tasha Yar redemption situation, she goes back and deliberately dies in order mm. to prevent the Daleks master plan from succeeding. So they repair that ambiguity. Mm. Um, at the time, shortest companion tenure uh, mm-hmm. so far, um, although there will be shorter uh, companion uh, tenures in the future. I mean, I wrapped up Adam, what's Kylie his Minogue name? In, um, the oh, that's special. that. She's a one-off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's that that Adam, the one that got the hole in his head. Yeah. The ninth Doctor. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, there there are shorter ones in the future, but um. She well, was, this she had this the too was fiz- this this too is only season three. I mean, yeah. this is only like mm-hmm. the third year of Doctor Who, so this is very early on that they went there. Right, and the, the, you, we wouldn't have a short tenure like four episode companion for a while after this i mean this was this was kind of a again jimmy as you said it's because they intended to be vicky all along and mm-hmm. so they had to they had to vamp a little bit although uh my guess is spoilers sarah kingdom also um bites the dust in this one yep um i that was presumably planned all along so she in fact she would have been she she was planned to they wanted her as a regular companion but oh. Jean Jean Marsh the actress was not interested in taking on a show at this time and so they ended up killing her in episode 12. Mm. Uh Jean Marsh comes back much later with the 7th Doctor which we saw. Yep. Uh, she's three times she's in in yeah, Doctor Who. She, and we've already met her once cuz she's Joanna in the Crusaders. Mhm. Oh right, right. So this is the third yep. of her appearances that we're seeing. Second of her. third for us, second for us, because we're we're wibbly yeah. wobbly, timey wimey. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Mavic Chen, which actually, that, the oh, name man, makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah, I love the name is fine with me, but wow, is this guy weird? I mean, well, I yes. have a Mavic uh, right uh-huh. now. It's, it's sitting over here. It's the DJI Ma- Mavic um, uh, drone. <laughs> which oh. <laughs> I have to wonder: did this? Did was someone a Doctor Who fan over DJI? That's funny. Maybe yeah. he is, he is a weird guy. So he's 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 the guardian of the solar system. So he's like effectively the highest human leader, and he is kind of imperious. He's got that British upper class, slimy, oily mm-hmm. villain vibe mm-hmm. to him. You know, um, but he he looks weird. Um, I'm at, for, at some half the time I'm not sure is he supposed to be human. Because right. he he looks so weird, he's got and th- now this is in the year four thousand. So this and and it's compensated or compounded by the fact this is in black and white. Mm-hmm. He has this white hair and a really dark skin tone, and it's not clear to me is that meant to be a human skin tone or not. Um, because right. so, so part of me wants to parse him as an alien, but apparently he's meant to be human, and I and he also has an epicanthic fold with his eyes. So he, if that's a human skin tone, which I gather it's meant to be, he presumably has mixed race ancestry right from either Australia or Africa to account for the skin tone and East Asia to account for the epicanthic fold and the name chin. Mm -hmm. He also wears super long pointy fingernails and he has the weirdest way of writing 
I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. He he is he right-handed, that. but instead of grabbing a pencil between his thumb and his first two fingers, what he does is and you'll be able to see this in the video version. What he does is he he grabs the pencil between the fingers of his hand so that he has the middle two fingers it, the the pencil goes under his first finger over his middle two fingers and then under his pinky again and yeah. and he has his thumb sticking up in the air and so, then he writes like that yeah to kind of kind of so dis- bizarre to kind of describe it for listeners it'd be like if you did you know the hang 10 sign but then straightened out the two folded down fingers and then wrapped around <laughs> mm-hmm. is yeah. kind of what it looks like yeah it's very yeah. It was kind of odd. It was almost like a calligraphy. And, I mean, it's not how they do um, Japanese or Chinese calligraphy, is it? it maybe not, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. It probably has to do with the very long fingernails that they put yeah. on the actor. That's probably yeah. the only way you can hold the, the pen. And he's got kind of a <laughs> long stylus too for for a pencil. It's not the normal sized pencil, so. Yeah. It, yeah. It's and, and he or, and he has this whole just unctuous urbane. Mm. Yes, of course. I'm. I want massive power, and I'm going to betray the entire human race to get it. In even yeah. though he's the leader of the entire solar system, uh, I want to uh, side side note. I love the way that early Doctor Who refers to the solar system. Everybody, the aliens, like it's. Yeah. it is like <laughs> the only solar system out there that you, know, you just use <laughs> solar system. It's the only well, solar system. Well, well, even when they talk about galaxies, it, we're not necessarily talking about like the Pegasus galaxy or the Andromeda galaxy. It's like other parts of our galaxy sometimes. Yes. You know? In the case of the solar system, I can cut them a, a little slack because the name of our sun is Sol. Yes. And so... So you could say, okay, in the future, this might be the solar system because it has Sol in it, whereas everything else is a star system. And yes, the solar system is a star system, but it's not the solar system because it doesn't have Sol. On the other hand, that's headcanon rationalization, and this is just um, this is just writers being unfamiliar with the with ast- astronomical <laughs> terminology of the day. It is interesting how science fiction terminology has evolved. I mean, it's very, you know, from the, in the sixties, there was a particular way of talking about these science fiction outer space concepts that really just evolved over time to what we have now. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we don't, science fiction today doesn't often talk about like space diseases and space yeah. guns and oh. just guns. Oh yeah. Diseases. There's a great episode, a great element in this where, um, one of the Daleks is, um, is there. So the Daleks are trying to chase the ship that the doctor and companions have stolen that because they got the terrarium. Um, or terranium or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, a little turtle in a jar. That would yeah. be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my favorite thing along those lines is in the lost skeleton of Cadavra, where, um, where Dr. Paul Armstrong is in search of that rarest of elements, atmospherium <laughs> and, and some aliens telepathically implant in his wife's mind, Betty, uh, in his wife's mind that she must get the atmospherium, but she mishears their telepathic message and she's hypnotized and it's like, I must get Amish terrarium, <laughs> Amish, Am- Amish terrarium. And, and her husband is like, Betty, that makes no sense. The Amish don't live under glass. They, they're they free air, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in any event, the Daleks are, are trying to track and get the spaceship they've stolen because they want the, the Terranium back. And um, at, at one point, one of the Daleks says to another, all is ready for their space extinction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they just shove the word space in yeah. front of just extinction. <laughs> know, Makes it like, cooler. You know, yeah, it's like, you know, just throw it randomly in the middle of sentences as, a, as, a, as an adjective. Why not? <laughs> um, so the, uh, oh, the Mavic Chen, yeah. The thing that was interesting to me is, is as you know, he's the leader of the solar system, but he has no entourage because, you know, whatever, maybe the... Well, well, he did, but they were all on his ship because he did have a crew on his ship. He had a couple guys that they, yeah, that they basically threw off onto Kembrel and doomed them to to death as one of those 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 thorny plants. Uh, 
But it's interesting how, you know, it wasn't enough. He wanted more. He wanted to be a ruler of a galaxy or whatever. You know, it's that, that sort of that that lust for power mm-hmm. that we see, you know, villains in, in these stories always want is they want it's never enough to be, you know, the most powerful guy in the smaller pond. I gotta be the the most powerful guy in right. the bigger pond and in the big in the lake in the sea in the world you know i always there's always more 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 and it's kind of interesting well, like why like well, well he's so work <laughs> he's well he's so blinded by it too that he doesn't even recognize like the daleks are they're just using him all these all these the aliens are. that are at this meeting yeah. don't realize oh yes the daleks are going to let us help rule the universe because of course the Daleks aren't happy with just a galaxy. They want everything because the Daleks they're Daleks, no and that's what Daleks with, want. With friends, uh, well, and, right? <laughs> yeah, but they just they, they they're blinded by the fact that no, the Daleks are gonna use you and throw you away as soon as they have what they want, which is everything. They want everything. They don't even want more power. They want all the power. Right? Don't they do that fairly early to that one alien that the uh, the doctor took his robe and, and dressed up mm-hmm. as him? I mean, he, they Zephyr. threw that guy under the bus pretty quickly. Zephon, yeah. Yep. Uh, well, he, 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 he's, he was, again, he was blind. He's like, oh, yeah, the Daleks need me. I'm not going to come to the meeting right away because they need me, and so they'll wait for me. Yeah, he, business tactic of making making people wait for you. Didn't work <laughs> out real well for mm-hmm. Zephon. By the way, I really like Zephon's design. Now, we don't see a lot of his body because he's wearing a robe. The mm-hmm. entire purpose of which is so the doctor can steal the robe and impersonate him. Yep. Yep. But basically, he's a, he's a plant. You know, he, you can tell he's like made of seaweed and you see he's, he's got these seaweed feet and these seaweed hands. And eventually after the doctor, later on, after the, do, after the doctor has impersonated him, we see him without his hood up and he's got this seaweed head. And I yeah. like that he's, I like that he's a seaweed plant. That's cool. Right. Yeah. It's not like Star Trek eventually does with the, just all the bumpy head aliens. They, <laughs> they really try to do something different with yeah. the aliens in this one. That was good. Uh, the, uh, the, the, it was interesting, the Daleks using American style, uh, jungle warfare tactics to, to bur- basically Over, burn the burn jungle the forest down. down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. It was, they're using their, and again, pyro flame guns. It's a little yeah. redundant. <laughs> mm, fire flame. I mean, <laughs> they're, yeah, they're flame, flame guns. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'm, I got to stop by an ATM machine later. <laughs> right. Yep. Don't forget to put in your pin number. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when the doctor's talking to Brett and, you know, he, he basically tells him, you know, look at the Dalek invasion, the last Dalek invasion of Earth back in 2100. And again, a a uh, callback to that previous story, the, uh, mm-hmm. the Dalek invasion. Um, where he uh, ditched Sarah or ditched where, Susan. Susan, yep. right. Um, so the Daleks keep coming back to Earth. They keep, they, they, they just, they just want Earth, don't they? They just yeah, want it so it's bad. It's been almost 2000 years. Yeah, well, there's been a couple of in- intervening yeah. ones as we've seen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, and the the the, the Daleks that they've decided Earth isn't enough; they want everything now. Right, but somehow so, Earth is the linchpin. It's the it's it's the starting point. It's where everything must begin in order to get everything. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to, that they for, for whatever Earth reason. is the easiest. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think. And their their plan is called Operation Inferno, and they have this device called the Time Destructor. Mm-hmm. That's what they get. But we don't get an explanation for what that is here. I assume no. we get it eventually. We will see it in operation. Okay. Time uh, gets destructed. Yeah. But it needs, I guess one of the reasons they need to start with Earth is, is because it needs the rarest of all elements, uh, terrenium, mm-hmm. uh, which is <laughs> only found in the solar system and is so rare. On, it took, on Uranus. Yes. Yes. Yep. And took fifty years to mine the amount they needed. So, uh, and it's a little. It looks like a coffee cup sized mm-hmm. container. I mean, it's it's not much. Right. It's one like, M. They call it E M M. Yeah, yeah, an M of it. Uh, it's like the amount that you need for a <laughs> of uranium for a hydrogen bomb or something. It's mm-hmm. it is not much. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And like like I said, it's Chekhov's uranium. Chekhov's time destructor. We'll we'll like you said, Jimmy. We'll see it in action. Eventually, um, it's what we kills this, Sarah Kingdom. That's how it kills. Okay, mm-hmm. all right. Yep. Um, so when they leave Kembrel to go head back to Earth, they end up crash landing on the prison planet Desperus. Yeah, good <laughs> name for a prison planet. Yes, yeah. that's very. They're desperate people there. But by, by the and, way, that's that's probably the most uh, epic TARDIS separation 
Mm-hmm. Yes. You literally leave the planet and go yes. to another, go to Earth, go back to Earth. Right. That TARDIS is way behind now. Um, and I thought it was interesting, like the, the, the sort of interlude. It was, if anything, if, if there was anything in this story that was kind of filler, it mm-hmm. was that interlude. Of, it, yeah. it, and it's so that they can kill uh, Katarina. That's, right. that's why they end up going to Desperus. Yeah, because yeah. Dirksen sneaks aboard uh, because he wants them to take him back to Cuba. I mean, or, Kirkson. Or Kembrel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kirk, is it Kirkson? Kirk, okay. Kirkson, yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I think autocorrect was being helpful Yeah, there, there. were there were three, uh, <laughs> three uh, convicts, and two of them got, got zapped. Uh, right. Non-fatally, uh, but electric. Yeah. Shocked, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Chen beats them back to Earth. Uh, it, it, uh, even though they have his very fast sh- uh, ship, the Spar. Um, the Daleks said they gave him a similar ship, so right. that's how mm-hmm. he was able to get back so fast. And he didn't get detained on Desperus for a while. Right. And nobody noticed that Chen came back in an odd, different ship. <laughs> well, I, I think they, they explain that. So Chen had, had left saying he's going on vacation, and he has this super advanced ship called a Spar, um, and the Daleks essentially gave him another spar and I guess mm-hmm. he, they don't go into this, but you know, like, I guess he changed the transponder number on it or something. Sure. That makes sense. Uh, so he claims that Brett is the traitor, um, and who's not going to believe the president of the soul or the, you know, the guardian of the solar system. Um, and he's got this character, Lizanne, was this, this, this was the mm-hmm. same woman from early on when yes. they were watching yep. a broadcast of, they were trying to decide what to watch and watched a broadcast of Chen leaving. Yeah. There were two kind of security officials. One of them was Roald, who was not impressed by, um, by Mavic Chen and wanted to watch sports. Mm-hmm. And there was Lizanne, who was a woman security lady, an official, who um, who wanted to watch the interview with Chen. So they kind of okay. compromised by watching the news, which would have both presidential yeah. interview and sports. And, uh, and it's kind of reminiscent, even though this is way down the line, it's kind of reminiscent of that episode of The Sixth Doctor, where um, we get social, con- we get... I forget if Robert Holmes actually wrote it, but we get mm. Robert Holmes style social commentary by watching the people at home watching television. Right. 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 Remember that one? Uh, yeah. Forget what it's called, but yeah, I remember that one. Um, so it's the one where Perry gets turned into a bird. Yes. Yep. Yep. So Chen. So, well, there's this, this moment where Lizanne and Chen and Chen's giving Lizanne orders to, 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 to you know, capture Brett. And, at one point in the exchange, she she says, "Don't you have faith in our computerized data? You know, as if like if something is computerized data, it must be perfect, right? Oh, yeah. I have every faith." And it's like from from a they, they had a high expectation for how computers would be so flawless in the future. Yeah. And as someone living in a computerized age, it's so interesting. Garbage to see in, how garbage it. out. <laughs> kind, kind, of, kind of like the uh, you know the old joke about it, it's on the internet. It has to be approved to be published, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, and then you know, there's this whole thing about they have the chemical makeup of every single. For, uh, one of the 40 billion people in the soul system on file and there is zero margin for error identification zero <laughs> margin for error i'm like wow that's that's kind of like that that being you know i hate to say it but that sounds like how people think of dna as mm-hmm. well you know dna testing and everything that is it's absolutely 100 percent flawless nothing can go wrong like somebody fudging the results i mean nothing can go wrong <laughs> yeah or or if you unless you sequence someone's entire even if you sequence someone's entire genome twins yeah um yeah. but if in a lot of dna tests do not sequence a person's entire genome they just look for certain markers mm-hmm. and yeah they may have a one in a million chance of being a random match but in a city with seven million people that means you've got seven matches <laughs> right right in this entire country there's 350 people who will match that mm-hmm. uh, yep. yeah so uh i just that was interesting again looking at the the perspective of the future from the past uh, so that's when we get Sarah Kingdom introduced. We kind of mentioned her uh, uh, a little bit already, but uh, yeah, she she's straight up slaughters uh, Brett Vion. He um, he does after- go for his gun first, though. Mm-hmm. Yes, yep. Um, uh, so we we're really it's revealed how you know she's she's ruthless. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. she's she's a uh, 
Well, she's, and, they, she's and they have a whole okay. conversation about hers where she, she follows orders. She doesn't question. Yeah. She doesn't ask. She just does. To, mm-hmm. to quote the Bad Batch, a good soldier follows, follows orders. orders. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But as we will learn next time in part five, she's Brett Vian's sister. Mm-hmm. And she, once she realizes she's been tricked into killing him by Mavic Chin, um, she's going to flip on Mavic right. Chin and become a companion to avenge what happened. And, I mean, Brett literally just got done killing his friend, Drexler, yeah. who mm-hmm. who he decides but, pretty quickly is a traitor. <laughs> Daxstar, yeah, but Daxstar himself was a Daxstar. traitor. It's just that yeah. that that Brett realized it. So lots of lots of uh, killing in the in 8400 4000. I was going to yeah. say this this has a high body count in these stories. Well, and and especially since part of the the, the opening is the opening speech by Chen is about how it's been 25 years since we signed this peace accords, you know, think of the UN type of setup mm-hmm. and we haven't had any war in, you know, since 3975. And now we're going to celebrate the 25th year of that by starting a massive intergalactic war. Right. Yeah. This is also kind of reminiscent. So this is like 1966. Mm-hmm. Or so, and it was it was like you know twenty years after World War II, so mm-hmm. that was kind of in and after the founding of the United Nations, so that's kind of part of the cultural background to how this would have resonated at the time. Mm. That's right, that's right. But yeah, I have in my notes lots of action, especially in part four, because we get four deaths. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, Kirkson and Katarina go out the airlock. Brett kills Daxstar, and then Sarah kills Brett. Oh, and then five because Zephon. Also oh, Zephon dies too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot. lot of lot of lot of uh, mortality in this one episode. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, any other notes on this one, Father Corey? So one thing we need to talk about is there was the connection to the the mission of the unknown, where the Doctor finds the audio recording from Agent Corey, and just grabs it and puts it in his pocket. Well, then as they're flying to earth from uh mm-hmm. desperous yeah. they're able to play the uh audio recording and we hear the, just a little snippet of that mm-hmm. original recording That's he right. also you know, finds Ma- finds mark Corey's skeleton yeah it was right next to his skeletons where they mm-hmm. found the, the tape so that that that's what convinced brett that that this was uh that there was something going on that they needed to fight against okay. uh jimmy anything else nope all right, so next time we'll be discussing episodes five, six, and eight. So if you want to uh, yeah. get ahead on uh, of us on that and go listen to those uh, and find episode, was it eight online somewhere and watch it? Uh, dailymotion.com is probably a good place you can find that. Uh, but I did want to bring up the listener feedback we got. This was on our recent uh, discussion of the fifth Doctor story, Warriors of the Deep. Stotzi writes on YouTube, Excellent video, gentlemen. I absolutely love this one back in the day. New season, new cricket sweater, new clothes for Tegan, and nope, no new clothes for Turlo, even though he hated the school on earth he was forced to attend. (laughs) Never before have I seen such a scathing verbal attack on the human race as I saw the doctor give in this one. Preston was my favorite supporting character in the story, but man, was she on the harsh receiving end of that outburst. Yes, the writing had some major flaws. The directing to... The murka was obviously the most embarrassing part. I had read that the fumes from the glue and paint actually made the people inside woozy, Mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. The strike at the time didn't help. And Davison has always been my favorite doctor, and this one was a warm welcome back for the Sea Devils and the Silurians, even when the two Sea Devils turn and bump into each other. As bad as the Stormtrooper in the original Star Wars hitting his head on the overhead door. Hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so uh i'm glad you enjoyed this uh yeah I, I mean i enjoyed the campiness of it there was some funny bits to it mm-hmm. but uh, yeah i didn't enjoy the story you know it was because it was bad that i enjoyed it yeah more so than because it was good um but yep uh so that's our feedback and now we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of doctor who including roberto b Vincent F, Don T, Lisa M, and Gerard T. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows at StarQuest, and you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. We'd also like to thank Simon Yannick, who edited this episode. 
So that's it from us. What did you think of the Daleks Master Plan, the, at least the four, first four episodes of it? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page. Send an email to Who at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord or leave a comment after you've watched the Secrets of Doctor Who on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash starquestmedia. Like I said, we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the 5th, 6th, and 8th episodes of the Daleks Master Plan. Until then, Jimmy Yakin, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Thank you. I'm ready for my space execution now. <laughs> Father Cory Stika, thank you as well. Thank you, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, I hope she's found her perfection. Perfection.